You're listening to the Racer Racer podcast presented by Race 92. Race 92 is a vintage-inspired racing apparel brand specializing in celebrating vintage race culture and adapting to motorsports today. Check out Race92.com for all your racing merchandise needs. I'm your co-host, Aaron Mack, to other co-hosts. You may have seen him walking out of Barber Lounge, 459 with big old smile on his face. You may have seen him at a dirt track. He's the one and only Scott Bowie. Hello, Aaron. Hello, Scott Bowie. How are you? I'm doing real good, bud. How are you? Doing great. So, um, first off, it was it was it was a crazy weekend. Great weekend. <laughs> um, you so had a very eventful weekend. It. Very eventful weekend. So we we're talking about doing the um, the Randy Lanier event. Um, I was a part of that at the Grand King Race Shops, and I've been advertising it for the past like two or three months. So you will officially stop hearing that advertisement because it is now done. Um, but you know, it was a great event Friday. There was Friday and Saturday. There was Saturday was com- complete sellout. Um, Friday, um, was pretty decent crowd as well. You were there Friday night. Um, and it, it was good. Yeah. It, it, Friday was really good. Um, and I, you know, I, I haven't spent too much time out at, uh, the Grand King shops with Billy and Stephanie Throngmorn's place um but it uh is an amazing facility if you are into um kind of older race cars they give it they have indie cars there sprint cars midgets they're it's a living museum they're restoring cars there as well and uh it just uh i know i was telling you at one point there were some cars sitting around some body work sitting around It's, it's like it's in a weird way it was like looking at my life uh, with some of the items uh, hanging that? on the wall. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's, there's, you know, this car <laughs> sitting over here that I remember so fondly or the, this hood over here that, you know, and, and that type of thing. And it just, um, it was a great time Friday and, uh, i uh, got to talk to some great fans of the show. I got to talk to a few of them that were there. Um, I apologize if there was somebody that wanted to talk to me and I didn't, have a chance to speak with you or you're making it you're nature. making it sound you're making it sound like you're just a hot commodity there right no it, it's kind of a joke but um no anyway it, it was a good time and uh and it's such a nice place they've got it you know they keep it so nice and, yeah. and uh so anyway and uh randy was a great speaker had a really <laughs> great time no he really is um you know obviously I've, i helped put the event together i i was there all day friday helping them set up and um i picked randy up from the airport got to spend all all day saturday with them um which was something i mean i'll never forget i'll I'll remember that till the day i die i mean it was um (laughs) truly a really really cool experience we got to go into the to the um, basement of the museum so special thanks to the ims museum and joe hale from the museum um for that opportunity and then we got to go in the in the normal museum, obviously. And, um, and then we got to go to Chip Ganassi's race shop. So Chip actually called Randy and he was like, um, yeah, you want to see the shop? So, you know, I was Randy's transportation. So we got to go to, got a private tour of the, um, Chip Ganassi race shop. So it was pretty cool as well. I've been in the shop, but it's been a while. Um, but this is obviously a little more private tour. Yeah, no, that's pretty cool. Uh, I remember you uh, texted me and was telling me you're heading to Ganassi's. Um, no, that, that's really cool. And, and um, I know it's something you worked hard on. I know it's something you're really looking forward to. And I'm glad you had such a good time. Uh, you put so much effort into just kind of the little parts of it. And then you were, you know, uh, making sure Randy got from point A to point B and that sort of thing. <laughs> um so no and it, there's a there's a lot that goes into that so i feel like a manager that, awesome. i feel like a manager and a lot a lot of wore a lot of hats this week and i feel like yeah no kidding I, i'm sure you felt that way absolutely <laughs> but no like i said I, I mean just the stories right i mean just the stories from that guy um i mean i i took him to the airport sunday morning at like six in the morning and i mean he was telling me stories then so i mean the guy just um, you know, just a, really a great person to talk to just the stories. Um, I mean, and really, if you think about it, like, if you think of all the people, like it's really hard to think of one other person anywhere, anyone who has a more, more interesting life than that guy. Right. I mean, 
it's, it's hard. It's it's full of ups and downs. That's for sure. Right. Um, I mean, there's some there's some high points and there's some low points, man. Yeah. Um, and but you know he toughed it all out and he's survived you know, he, it all and you know beat the odds and he was there to do the talk this weekend gracious enough um you know uh, <clears throat> to be able to put himself in a position to be able to do that and of course the granite king shops again um making all of that happen so it was just it was a really um really interesting friday night I had a really good time got to see uh i mean we talked to Donnie Beachler, who was there. Yeah. Um, we, you know, his crew chief or one of his crew members from his Blue Thunder racing days was there. Yeah. Um, and so, one of the crewmen <clears throat> from his IndyCar days was there. And then you said that you even had a special surprise afterwards. You well, didn't even know he was there on Saturday. No, and Randy didn't even get to talk to him. We found out ahead of time, like the guy had to go and he just left. Apparently Saturday there was a guy there that was w- w- with the U S coast guard. And he was actually assigned to, to part of Randy's case when Randy was like on the run. And he was like one of the people looking for him, um, which is just insane. And Randy found out about, it. he's like, man, I want to talk to that guy. So I'm, I'm glad you reminded me because I need to, I need to get with them to see if they can put him in touch um, because he, he, he wants to talk to him. So I, I think that'll be cool. Um, but, yeah. It's a shame. Yeah. It's a shame that you man, didn't know that, about that before. I know. You know. Because that would have been amazing, dude. It really would have been. Would have been absolutely. It really, it really would have been. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously he was there to speak. I mean, he's. I mean, he got. He's kind of like an inspirational speaker now. I mean, obviously, like he's yeah. really um, reflective on life, and he really has some good insight about just how people still live their life. Obviously, he was in prison for twenty seven years, so he had a lot of time to think about things, right? right? Um, so you know. It was interesting to hear him. Like I said, there's always a different story. I mean, the dude's just full of stories. And, you know, if you haven't, please get his book, Survival of the Fastest. He was there signing them. Um, I believe Stephanie and Billy do. I know they have some extra signed books, I believe. So if you do want a signed book, you can let me know or let them know. And they should have some signed books for people if they want to buy one, if they weren't able to go to the event. <clears throat> But um, yeah, no, ab- absolutely. Some like I said, um, I'll I'll never forget. I'll never forget that. Like Randy, Randy said when we left. Um, so when we went to the museum, we were with Billy, my dad, and then Todd Bedenhausen. Um, and that I mean that was a cool experience because Todd knows a lot about the cars, and he was telling Randy about you know all of his dad's cars. His dad being Gary Bedenhausen. Um, and there was also a car from his grandfather down there as well, and he was talking yeah. about that. And and Randy, I could tell Randy really, really enjoyed that aspect. And when he left, he said that, you know, these are memories he'll never, ever forget. And he was just thankful that we were there and, you know, we were able to get that set up for him. Um, and I there mean, was a you, picture. Could you imagine <clears throat> being him 15 years ago and you're sitting in jail and he openly talks about all this. Obviously, he wrote a book yeah. about it. He's very open uh, about everything in his yeah. life. And uh, he's sitting in, in the cell and most likely sitting in, in the hole, right? I mean, 11 yeah. by 7 cell or whatever it was. Um, and then 15 years later, you know, in the basement of the museum, he never thought he'd ever get out of prison. Yeah. And 15 years later, he's in the basement of the museum and they're looking at old race cars. And he's got Chip Ganassi calling him. And <laughs> I mean, it's he, pretty he amazing. Had Doug, he had Doug Bulls calling him, too. Within yeah, 45 it, minutes, we're sitting at breakfast. Doug Bulls calls him, and you know, half hour later, he's getting a call from Chip Ganassi. So, um, yeah, that's just, just crazy. No, it really is. Um, and what you know, life what, just it's amazing how life just changes on a dime. Oh, I mean, absolutely. I mean, sometimes for better and sometimes for worse. Yep. But we were, um, and I mean, and, for, and that has happened to him, obviously. I mean, he was living his best life, and his life changed just like that. And then, you know, and then it kind of went back to i mean not back to how it was but obviously he's a lot better off now than he was 10 years ago sure um but one of my favorite pictures of the weekend was right when you walk into the um to the building before you actually get into the museum they have all the rookies on the wall and it was just a great picture of randy standing there pointing at his name nine under 1986 um that's a great photo I, i absolutely love that photo yeah i thought it was a really great photo too and you sent it to me and 
I just thought, you know, again, wow. I mean, if you think about where this guy's come from yeah. and everything he's been through, you know, it's just, um, man, what an amazing story. No, for sure. Um, but I mean, there's really not a whole lot of racing news, right? Yeah, the F1, really about the only thing going on is F1 was in uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil. You know, it's been a long time since I've watched a race around. I forgot what an amazing racetrack that is. Mm-hmm. I mean, I w- that is a track I wish IndyCar could go run. Uh, I mean, a lot of passing. It's, you know, a lot of elevation changes, a lot of really neat corners. And um, George Russell scores his first two wins of, the, of his career. He wins a sprint on Saturday. He wins the uh, the Grand Prix on Sunday, uh, and his teammate Lewis Hamilton. I don't I don't remember if Lewis ran second in both of them or he ran third in the sprint, but he was up up there as well. Mercedes all of a sudden at the end of the year looks like looks like the Mercedes of old. Um, tough racing. Kevin Magnuson sat on the pole for the sprint. Uh, he just he, if you find a radio. Um, the you can find the YouTube video, or whatever you want to meet him, you want to check out uh, the of the end car. Like he just couldn't believe he was going to be on the pole. Um, so that was cool. Unfortunately, and he ran eighth in the sprint, and he got crashed early uh, in the uh, Grand Prix by Daniel Ricardo. Um, there was a lot of bumping and banging early in that race. Um, a lot of emotions were high. Red Bulls wanting Max Verstappen to let Checo get by. Verstappen wouldn't do it after the race. He told him, don't ever ask me that again. I told you last year, and I took, gave you my reasons. And, of course, Checo was like, hey, now we know exactly who this guy really is. So, you know, it's kind of like we've talked to some of the other F1 drivers. Typically, the the driver they're most in competition with is their teammate. So, other than that, um man there isn't much in the way of racing like you said everything's fairly dead usac midgets are um on the west coast i think they start racing tomorrow night um they've got two or three shows leading up to turkey night which is actually i think the day after thanksgiving now um because you you know after 50 some years you want to change that tradition last year so but that uh, that race will be next week, obviously, with Thanksgiving coming up. So, not much racing though. Nope. So a couple uh, announcements really before we talk about our guests for this week, and then we'll just get straight into that. Um, thanks to Racer Collect, who's um, you know Patrick Patton is a great guy. He actually was out there Saturday night for the Randy Lanier event. He had a really good time. Um, you know, if you're looking for any kind of racing memorabilia, please go to racercollect.com. Um, I mean, we're, so we're talking about how, you know, life can change for, you know, from good to bad or bad to good and mat- on a dime, you know, what else can change is the weather. And when the weather changes from 70 degrees to this Friday is going to be 20 degrees. Got to make sure you have a reliable source of heat. Yes. And I do. And because Scott the good folks does. Are good guys. Yes, I do. And I, I keep it a I keep it a smooth seventy in here. I realize that with the prices of things, that's probably not the smartest thing to do. And probably in the dead of winter, I'll have to tone it back a little bit because, again, prices are very high for reasons nobody ever seems to want to talk about. But that's a whole different subject. Um, but yeah, the good folks, the good guys, keep me tuned up, and everything's running perfect. Not a problem. Um, so thankfully I'm going to be able to stay warm this winter and, um, yeah, no, that's, that's a good thing. Hey, something I did want to mention, um, speaking of life turning on dime, not that he's somebody that we know, but he is one of the biggest car fanatics in the world. Jay Leno, unfortunately, and the reports are kind of very burnt. Um, (laughs) At his car, you know, where he keeps his cars, one of them caught on fire and he was standing next to it from the sounds of things. And uh, he got burnt in his upper body. Some reports say he got his face burnt. Uh, he's in the hospital. And uh, while in no way would he ever listen to this, I 
do really appreciate his love of vehicles and Absolutely. little cars. And uh, he actually was part of when they did that um, uh, when they did that movie on page a few years ago. He was one of the executive producers. So uh, uh, in a roundabout way, he has meant something to somebody that I care for a lot. So best wishes to him and his family. And uh, hopefully everything works out all right. I actually have the replica of the pace car he drove for the 500 behind me. Yeah, it's just, yeah, just so, man, it just, it, it's amazing. I mean, he's had all those cars for all those years. And I think he, wasn't he in a, he was in a bad crash with the Hemi under glass, I think just a couple of years ago. Yeah. He was a passenger, really I think though. Um, and then, I mean, fire, I wouldn't wish fire on anyone that, I mean, I, I just wouldn't. It, it I, and I know other people out there were the same way. It just, man, I, I think we've all seen what fire can do to a human. It's just scary. So best wishes to him. And, um, other than that, I think that's about all I've got. The, so our next live show, um, at McGilvery's is going to be December 6th. So we'll finalize that and then get that out as soon as we know we can confirm our guest, but it will be December 6th at 7 p 7 p.m. I almost forgot what time it is. 7 p.m. I've been talking about all these other events. It's just I get confused after a while. But no, December 6th, 7 p.m. in McGilvery's and Speedway. Um, definitely would love to see everyone out there. And um only other thing i won't mention fast times indoor karting um i just released jimmy kite go car video on friday the views have definitely been pretty good on it so far so i definitely um really enjoyed it. it was a lot of fun like i said we're you know excited to have this partnership with fast times where they're allowing us to do these videos um obviously it's a good promotion for them and it creates great content for us and it's a lot of fun um so you know we're we have a couple others planned now with some former, you know, Indy 500 drivers as well as some, you know, up and coming drivers, current drivers. So definitely um, look forward to those. Those are, man, those are a ton of fun. They really are. I, uh, and today's show guest, Nikki Hayes, hopefully we can get him out there I know. later on. So yes. you can take a, take a shot at Jagger's time. And then we can create some bitterness there that we can, kind of tease Jagger about if he beats his time. So hopefully that can happen. Uh, no, man, Nikki was so fun to talk to. He uh, really was. Yeah. He's a great guy. I, I don't know him. I only, you know, we, both of us just kind of met him at the at Cape motorsports this year mm -hmm. uh, at the races. So uh, really good dude. And uh, I wish him nothing but the best for next year. Sounds like he's got some plans. He just don't have uh, anything ready to announce, but it sounds like he'll definitely be racing again next year. And uh, I hope everybody enjoys it because I, I really enjoyed talking to him. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, we'll just get right into it. And um, every, I think everyone will enjoy it. And I hope everyone has a great week. Take care. Bye. Our guest today most recently drove in the USF 2000 for Cape Motorsports during the 2022 season. We we're joined by Nikki Hayes. Nikki, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing? Good. Thanks so much for having me. Excited to be on here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank so, you so much, Nikki. Obviously, um, you know, you I, I know you had some really good finishes near the end of 2022. But first off, um, I guess first off, talk about your season a little bit. Yeah, it was kind of a whirlwind. Um, I got the first email from Dominic Cape about February 3rd. So only a few weeks before St. Petersburg. I hadn't driven in US 50,000 at all. Um, just kind of kept in contact with the Capes over the years and was a little surprised to, to hear about the opportunity. So yeah, once, once I got that first email, just kind of scrambled to get some funding together to start the year and just kind of went in blind and took it for, for, for what it was. And yeah, it was a huge building year, but super thankful for the opportunity to get my career shifted on the road to Indy and, and eventually, you know, come out with some solid results in the end. So you're racing, I mean, really started with go-karts, right? How old were you? And I guess what kind of um, got you interested or got you started in racing? Yeah, so I started racing karts when I was around five. So my dad is a mechanic by trade. So always kind of been around cars. My dad built race cars for 
for people um, outside of his main job. And, and he's just kind of always had me around race cars and, and the racetrack. So he started go-karting a little bit for fun. Uh, I went when, you know, I was two or three years old. And then when I turned, yeah, I think three or four, he got me a little electric cart to drive up around the neighborhood. And, and yeah, I got my first race cart when I was five. And then it kind of all spiraled into what it is now. And how old were you when you actually, so you did cards for several years. You actually yeah. won, you won a championship of cards, right? Yeah. So I won my first title in like 2009, a couple. And then I think I won one to two championships a year from like 2014 to 17. So like the majority of when I was like, I think maybe 11 or 12 to when I was 15 to 16. Uh, yeah. I had a lot of success out here in California. Just uh, lucky to win, win a lot of titles back to back to back. So that was kind of um, when things got more serious as I kind of came of age to see um, what my ability was like. And that's when opportunities started to, to really come. What, uh, so uh, did you run, run anything between carts and uh, USF 2000? Had you, had you raced anything else or was it like a jump from carts to USF 2000? So in, in 2018, I got selected by Burrell, uh, which is a go-kart manufacturer, to go over to France for a driver selection. Um, and that kind of started my real car racing career. Um, I'd done a little bit of club car racing up until that point in like a Formula Ford. Uh, so on the East Coast and the West Coast. So that was kind of me getting my feet wet, but never really expected to go to like a professional style series. And then in 2019, I actually raced and lived over in France in the French F4. Um, so I had some success over there, won some races, ended up in the top three in the championship. So that was 2019. And then I did two, I did three weekends here in the U S and F4. Um, so that was a pretty, that was like my first really big year in, in car racing. And in 2020, I did the formula regional championship. Um, and then, you know, it was, it was one of those things where I got lucky, where I started, um, you know, building momentum right before COVID and, and like you saw with a lot of people, 2021 was really tough because there was really no, there was, there was not a lot of opportunity to invite sponsors out to racetracks and, and really have that engagement. So 2021 was a pretty quiet year for me. Um, I did some stuff in, with Acura and uh, GT3 Academy. Uh, so that was a great opportunity uh, with, with Honda and Acura for 2019 and 2020 um, and through 21. But honestly, going into this year, there was a lot of unknowns. And I hadn't raced in almost two years um, before we started St. Pete and USF. So it was, I had some experience. It just was kind of sporadic and always last minute. So um, to answer your question, yes, I did have some experience before USF. <laughs> now you're talking about moving over to France to run an F4. I mean, it, when a lot of people, like a lot of people we talk to that race in America and they go over to Europe, their intention is to you know, eventually get in formula one. I mean, mm -hmm. was that kind of your goal? Yeah. So at the time I was one of the two selected by Winfield racing school. It was a, a revamped, uh, basically scholarship driver selection program. And they were really pushing to have an American shoot up the formula one ladder. Um, so for a brief time period, you know, formula one is what, what I was looking at. And at, at the time that was kind of a whirlwind of, I was really just coming from karting and a little bit of club racing to, the most intense um, atmosphere in, in the world. So there was definitely a thought, but to be honest, the, the amount of money that you need to spend to get to Formula One and the kind of connections and relationships you need to have. Um, I basically had one group of people behind me who were able to support me in my first year, but to continue to move up into Formula Three, Formula Two, um, just wasn't realistic. So I took it for what it was and then kind of had to shift my focus from there. Now the um, Formula Four cars and Formula Regional cars—they're the same cars, right? For the most uh, part? So the regional car is kind of—it's like in between. It's almost like a—it's essentially an old, old regulation for Formula Three. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's pretty big. It's heavy. It's got like 300 horsepower. So it's—it's it's a big step up. Um, it's got a lot more weight, a lot more power, a lot more aerodynamics. So it's—it is a jump coming from the F4 stuff. About 11 seconds a lap. Oh wow! Yeah. Wow. I, um, so I, I remember last year when they announced you and, um, 
I thought, boy, you know, I, I did do a little research. I thought, man, this, this kid's got some experience. It's going to be interesting to see how it does. And it seemed like the beginning of the year was just kind of hit and miss. Yeah. And um, it always, you know, obviously you saw us at the track, um, you know, hanging out with Jagger and stuff like that, but we didn't really talk a lot. And I always kind of wanted to ask you, like, was it the transition that made it like that for you? Because you could see the talent. Like, I could see you would have flashes. Like, you would, your times would jump up, and then, but then they would kind of level off and that, that sort of thing. It, was it mm-hmm. just a, an odd adjustment for you, or was it even the fact maybe you were going to a little lesser horsepower? Yeah, it was a mix of all the stuff I'd been driving. So the Formula Regional car was, I think, 1,500 pounds, and the GT3 car I drove the year before in 2021 was like 3000 pounds and 500 horsepower. So it was kind of learning a totally different style of driving and keep in mind, I didn't do any testing. Uh, I I did absolutely zero testing. So you're going into these race weekends, learning racetracks and also trying to understand how these cars work. Um, So it was kind of like, okay, how much of this is like learning the track, understanding this different style. Um, And honestly, the, the biggest thing was how close the fields were. I mean, it's, it's like go-karting, right? There's no other, no other open wheel series. The, the, I'd argue USF 2000 was probably the most competitive and closest in times um, of all the championships. So it was definitely like, you know, qualifying, you know, three tenths could be eight spots. Right. Right. So that was one of those things where, you know, that's, that was a huge, you know, huge thing to overcome. Um, and I'm, I was trying to understand how to, to get the most out of the car. And every time you do it, you're under pressure, under, uh, you know, where it matters. So, you know, it definitely took some time. And it, it was probably the first season in my career that I was like, dang, I, I don't just show up and I run in the top three immediately. Right. That was that was most of my experience up to that point. So it was definitely humbling. And you just had to, you know, take it for what it was and and, and just roll with the punches, basically. So it was like one of those things you're like, you know, once you got there, you kind of learned what it took. Yeah. And then you, you had to adapt everything you knew to, to getting to that. Day. Yeah, absolutely. Now, how do you think the competition kind of um, compares from over in Europe to America? I mean, is it pretty equal or is there, is there just like a huge difference? There's really not a huge difference. I think maybe the level of – the average of the teams, keep in mind, because there's F, there's an F4 championship in almost every single country, Italy, Germany, um, France, England, right? The, and these are all sometimes 30 to 40 car championships. So there's just more people in a smaller area, right? Because these countries are tiny. France is not big. Italy's not big. So you have like kind of a more condensed um, atmosphere. Right. So I think in the U.S., it'd be like having a West Coast championship that's really intense, a Midwest championship that's really intense and a floor like a South and Florida championship. So it's it's almost just the volume of intensity is higher, but the guys who are good are good. It, it doesn't necessarily I wouldn't say the guy who's winning in the U.S. is any better or worse than the guy winning over in Europe. Right. I I um. Yeah, I, I think that was an interesting question because I've often wondered that myself. Uh, just, just what is the competition level? Because people talk about, you know, going to Europe, and then there's this kind of the same where like American drivers aren't always accepted very well in Europe for some reason, yeah. even if they're working with teams and that sort of thing. And I've always wondered if it if it was a, just, it was just the competitive part of it. Like they they don't like if you didn't grow up there, they didn't really want yeah. you to come in and be more successful than somebody who followed you know the, the traditional footsteps over there yeah it was you know that was definitely what I expected and I'd say the first ever time I went over there for a selection I felt that but when it came time so I, I competed in the French championship and it's funny like they love American culture they're all wearing Amber Combrie and Fitch they they all wear like they all listen to American music I don't know if this is a more recent thing with, with social media and, and those kind of things, but they absolutely love everything about America. Um, but I think the, the, the biggest difference is the culture, right? Cause if you're, so like for me coming from like the Southern California, LA area, 
-hmm. if you want to do stuff, you can do it 24 seven, right? It's as simple as like a supermarket. Yeah. It's, you never really count on it being closed there. They open it at 10 AM and they close it at 6 PM. Right. So it's, it's just a mindset of things aren't necessarily in a rush and the way we do things in the U S it's just such a different lifestyle that there's, there's always going to be a little bit of clashing if you don't, basically you have to conform how to how they are and you have to expect, um, expect them to be how they are. Oh, that, that makes sense. Uh, you know, I mean, America, we've, we're so used to abundance. Yeah. That, like, like you were saying, uh, that it is, it is hard for people to understand. I almost equate it to like, just from other people I've talked to, I haven't spent any time over there, but just talking to other people, I've often thought of it more as like going from a giant city to a really small town. Yeah, absolutely. And it's the, I mean, on Sunday, nothing happens. Right? Absolutely. Right. You want to get your phone fixed? You're going to wait until Monday. <laughs> right. So it, it, it's just how it is. There's no, there's fast food is not a thing, right? Nothing is fast, convenient, quick. That And that's just how they do things. And it, you have to basically su- accept how they are, understand it. And I think the big thing is actually you have to live over there and understand the culture in order to, to work with the people. Yeah. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. You know, it's a really good way of putting it. I mean, we've asked other drivers similar, similar question. And um, that that's probably one of the best answers I think yeah, we've ever got. I agree. <laughs> so, um, you know, you're talking a little bit about adapting back to formula regional America. Um, I mean, first off that that's a series that Scott Goodyear runs, right? Yeah, yeah, he's. I think I don't know if he's a series director, or race director. He he's yeah. in charge of F four and that. So what I mean was there? So I mean, obviously he's a great mentor. Um, for I mean, really racing in America. I mean, racing in general, right? But mm-hmm. what, did they have like some kind of mentor like that when you were over in in France? Yeah, I mean, I had basically like one of the best driver coaches there is. So part of like my sponsorship from Winfield racing schools I had, it was, it was interesting. There's a a mental coach, a driving Mm -hmm. coach who was like everywhere with me and just kind of overall support system. So it was, it was definitely a jump because I was used to kind of rolling solo. So you had like, you know, someone always there by your side to, you know, who spoke French, for example, right? Like I understand, like I eventually learned French, but even if it's not your first language and you're there alone, you're going to kind of feel like you're on an Island. So I had you know, people who had made it and kind of successful people. I, I'd like to think I had some of the best people over there around me for that year. Oh, wow. Um, so, I mean, so after the Formula Regional America, you did the HPD GT3 Academy? Was yeah. So is that formula cars or is that more like a sports car type? Yeah, so that was actually all sports cars. So that's okay. based, it's, it's based off of production Acura NSX. Um, and that was a whole, I spent a whole year um, doing a lot of driver coaching and personally driving in sports cars. And it's a totally different, you know, these cars are three, you know, three to 3,500 pounds, right? So three times the weight, tons of power, a mm-hmm. um, little bit of downforce. So that's a totally different discipline. And I spent all of 2021 basically driving cars like that. Oh, wow. So let me ask you this. Uh, and this is something I really noticed with you. Um, and I thought it was so great. And all the races I went to is maybe the exception of one. Uh, I noticed that your family was really heavily involved. With yeah. Coming to the races and just being there for you. Mm-hmm. And um, when you went to France, you m- most likely didn't have that. It, was that something that that took a little time getting used to in France or was that something that more evolved when you come back home? Uh, absolutely. So I graduated high school a few months early. So I was 17 when I went and I went from being in high school, right. Living at home to going to a foreign country in a tiny city. I didn't speak the language and I lived by myself in this like apartment that looked like a, like a room in a hospital. Right. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And, and, And it, and it rained every day. Right. So I I came from by the ocean to to that. So it was definitely kind of a like, you know, you go over there and it was such a quick deal. I had three weeks notice that I was going to move across the world. Um, 
And it was just one of those things where it's like, okay, like I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know the good, bad or, or anything. I just knew that I was going to go and I was going to do it. And uh, yeah, it was definitely a big adjustment, but I'd like to think I had kind of a French family, um, the Winfield racing school. I, you know, I worked as an instructor. I stayed near them uh, for the second part of the year and I was kind of always around somebody. Uh, so I, I go over there about once a year now to do some, some coaching work. And it, it just feels like an extension of my family uh, just through motorsports. Right. One thing I noticed too, man, is, is no matter really where you finish, man, your family is always happy. Yeah. They just, they just, they love seeing you do something that you love. Yeah. You can just really pick that up. And I, I just thought that was really cool. Yeah. You know, it's at the end, like, you know, we're very normal people and, if you look at the cards, I'm not meant to be a race car driver, right? They're normal people. I don't have, there's no fame. There's no, my mom or dad isn't an executive at some big company. We're very lucky to, I, I'm very fortunate that with them, they've, they've given me the skills to, to build relationships with people who can make this dream chasing a reality. Um, so you have to kind of, you know, even if you're, if you're in mid pack, right, at least you're not sitting on the sidelines. That's the reality That's of it. Right. Well, so, you got you got to be in the game to be in the game. I mean, that's exactly. just how it is. Yeah, the fastest guy. I think someone told me this like two weeks ago. The fastest guy is always on the sidelines, wishing he had your money. Right. That's right. So yep. that's right. So I, I would guess uh, um, this past year at probably Raceway Park, that was probably your first time ever on an oval, right? Yeah. Yeah, that was a an, a total eye opener. I I I wasn't against or for oval racing i just didn't know much about it and the first time i went i 120 miles an hour never felt so fast on a <laughs> <laughs> like in any right. car that was yeah. that was really really an eye opener for sure yeah raceway park is kind of an anomaly uh in, for that type of racing because you run it by the fence uh just you know the way the track's built it's not a normal type of oval situation that you would run like you would run not that the usf 2000 runs iowa but like you would run iowa or or uh or gateway much different than you run raceway park so not only is it 120 mile an hour it's 120 mile an hour right against the fence yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah it was kind of like wait you're telling me i have to run along the wall the whole track and i don't get to touch the brake Right. But I can't right. be easily flat because it, it doesn't really feel banked mm -hmm. like enough right. to like help you help you at all. So that was kind of like it felt really easy. Like it was your one one touch of one of the seams from hitting the wall. Right. So right. That, that, that's what it what it felt like. And I'm like, man, is this how all ovals feel like this tense the whole time. But but it was uh, it was unfortunate. We had we had a small issue. So I wasn't able to finish the race. Right. Um, so it started in, in practice and qualifying. But but I remember we, we did the test there and it was like 30 degrees and every, right. like every other session I'm, I saw mist coming down and I'm like, is it raining or is this like, like I, I, it was, it was definitely like very, <laughs> very nerve wracking of like, I could destroy, it felt like you could destroy the car just with one little, little mistake. No, oh, no. Yeah. Well, one thing about it, you're so close to the fence, you're not going to hit it that hard. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. I guess. Yeah. That's a good point. <laughs> so this um past well i guess what about a month ago you tested indy lights card during the chris griffiths test right yeah so, so that was like yeah almost two weeks ago now mm -hmm. um and that was you know after after portland and i went to laguna seca just just to show my face and do some networking since our season was over um i kind of had a thought of all right why not give a crack at at moving up into lights um you know, I talked with, with Dominic Cape about it and, and a few different people. And, and, you know, it was just one of those things where like, let's see how it goes and, and see what happens. You, at the end of the day, like you have to raise money anyway, right? You're going to be, it, it's part, you're going to be asking people whether it's 400,000 or a million dollars. So that was, that was kind of the thought process. So let's see what, what lights is all about. And yeah, I ended up doing that a couple of weeks ago. I think I read some more. You just talked about the the size of the car was something that you were uh, kind of not ready for. I mean, not not that you weren't ready to drive yeah. it, but like it took you kind of by surprise how how large, how much bigger it seemed. 
yeah, it's big. And like the main thing is just how like it's fast. Like it, it's I've, I've driven stuff over the years and I've never gotten out and said, wow, this is a beast of a car. It moves around. Um, it's violent, but also, um, you know, really like pleasant to drive. It's a, it's a really good, really, really good car. And I could see, you know, after after a few laps, you know, the speed you, you get used to it. It's just pulling all the speed out of it is going to be a whole nother another battle as with any new race car. Yeah, Stingray Rob, uh, we did talk to him not too long ago, and uh, he said he talked about he felt like Indy Lights was much harder than it was even when he ran the Indy car. Just as far as the car always felt on edge, it always yeah. felt right on the edge. Indy yeah, I that's what he wanted to do. Yeah, that I think a lot of it is the Cooper tire that that was on it for the year. I was actually really shocked about how much the car was moving. Not and it was just the tire, to be honest. It was it's just designed a certain way to to slip quite a bit, almost like like some cars I've driven on street tires. So it was just the most out of control, in control um, kind of situation on the front, the rear, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm I'm curious to see. I, I I'm feeling the Firestone is going to change a lot of that, and the car is going to be even faster. Um, but we'll see. Right. So if you, I guess, if you kind of look ahead of, in your career, say the next five years, where would you like to see yourself? Yeah. Or maybe think, even next two years or three years. We don't have yeah. to necessarily do five. Yeah. I mean, obviously the goal is to move into Indy Lights for next year. I mm -hmm. think just take it as a, as a learning year. Uh, could be one year, could be two years. Uh, and within the next three to five, it's for sure to be full-time in IndyCar. Um, sure. You know, it's, it's such a crazy sport and it's always changing in the way of guys coming into IndyCar getting paid and guys bringing seven to $10 million a year. Right. right. So it's, it's one of those things where it's going to come down to timing, but also just being able to perform when it really matters. So that's the goal with moving into lights is to really, you know, learn, uh, learn the things that you need to learn with a car that's heavy, fast, um, tons of downforce. Cause it is, a totally different style than, than driving the F2000. So I'd figure I'd, I'd spend some time learning there. We'll see how things go, but for sure being in, in the big show is, is where the trajectory is looking. I think one of the hardest things everybody's going to have to do this year is and me, myself included is uh, learn that it's not Indy lights anymore. It's Indy yeah. next. Indy next. Yeah. I was surprised to hear that as of, I, I think it was what, five hours ago, maybe that yeah. they did the, did the whole thing um yeah that was i guess it's something to do with wwe <laughs> like i don't watch wwe but <laughs> but i guess i mean it, it, it's I, presented by firestone I, now so that that's good enough <laughs> I, yeah i just think that they're trying to i would assume if if i'm putting myself in whatever meeting that was they're uh they're just trying to figure out a way to you know, like this is a stepping stone to Indy. Indy. Yeah, exactly. And it that makes would sense, be, right? <laughs> that would be my guess. Now, yeah. I'm not sure if I would pick the name Indy next, but I guess five years from now, we'll all be used to it and yeah, it won't matter. But uh, yeah. it's just, it, it feels weird to say. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it's, I don't think there's an E in it. Um, no. So nope. <laughs> nope. It's just NXT. Yeah. Yeah. But to be honest, I think, Penske Promotions is doing a great job with the series and, sure. you know, with the Peacock coverage and, and just the way they treat the whole organization as a whole, um, when you're bringing sponsors and, and so on and so forth, it, they feel a step up, right. And they, they right. feel that professionalism from the series and, and that they're really a part of, of the IndyCar family. So that was part of, you know, the big reason of the thought process behind it too, is, you know, these people who are backing you, they want to feel excited and they want to feel important. Right. So that's, that's part of the, the thought process for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you know, we're talking about, you know, your goal obviously is to be an IndyCar biggest race of the world, obviously biggest race in IndyCar is the Indy 500. Mm -hmm. I mean, was that something that you grew up watching or kind of what was your first um, introduction to the Indy 500? So the 500, like just the first introduction to IndyCar was the Long Beach Grand Prix. So it's 20 minutes from me uh, out here. And I remember watching the lights races and the IndyCar race as a kid. So that was kind of what sparked the interest. 
the 500 has always been something I paid attention to, but definitely more so as I got older. Um, I think one of the first years I watched like really, really intently was when I think it was either Juan Pablo, last time Juan Pablo won it, or when Takuma won it the first time. Uh, I think it was when Juan Pablo made, he basically made a pass in the grass where I, I watched <laughs> it and he, and he didn't crash where I was like, dang, that's, that's pretty cool. And just the, I think as I've done more stuff on the path to IndyCar, I respect the 500 more and more and more. Uh, just even spending time in India itself, you really understand how much it kind of takes over the town and, and how much people really understand what's going on or in tune with it. So, yeah, like you said, you stayed near main street there in speedway. So you kind of get an idea, uh, you know, the, the Delara factories right by their bell helmets. Isn't too far from there. Um, you know, there's, other places that are more you know kind of racing either businesses will foit right down the yeah. street um so it, it is interesting um it, and it's just a small look at at what it really is a really is but uh did you did you stay for the 500 this year or did you did you head home i headed home because i i actually i think i don't know when i got covid but i think i got it at irp or <laughs> or when i got stuck in dallas before so I got super sick. So I just, I, I decided to bail because I had COVID. Uh, so right. I didn't get to stay. Um, so next year for sure we'll be, we'll be there. Yeah, I, I would, uh, I would suggest that anybody who just wants to even be a part of it should really, I mean, obviously during the, the one week you're, you're racing. Yeah. It's hard to soak it in, but to really try to soak it in and, um, you really do see that. I mean, so much, so much of this sport revolves around that was now just a couple weekends, but it revolves around that place. And, uh, it's, it's pretty, pretty amazing, really. Yeah. It, it blows my mind. Like, like I said, as I get older and understand more, someone like Helio, he's basically going to have a job as long as he wants right because of i mean Pretty four much. times right like it's it's and he he's done it before and who knows he could do it again it's it just it's interesting hearing like even guys like Newgard and they're like yeah they won the championships but every time you hear him interview it's like okay i really 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 want that 500 because they know what it what it'll do for their career so yeah that is really interesting too i mean we've we've talked about it on this show i mean joseph Newgarden, i think arguably is the best driver in indycar right now Absolutely. I mean, I think you can make a real case for it, but the one thing you can't make the case for is, is that he hasn't won the 500 yet. And, and is that his fault? Absolutely not. But it's just, that's kind of, you're a little young for this, but being someone like Dan Marino who held all the passing records, never won the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a, our Charles Barkley was an amazing basketball player, never won the NBA, you know, title. And it's just, it's always stuck with him. It, it sticks with you as a race car driver too. If you have yeah. a great career and you can't, you can't pull off that one win. It, yeah. It's not fair. It's absolutely no. not fair, but I mean, that's just how it is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I don't really have much more. I mean, you have anything, Scott? Yeah. I was going to say, you know, uh, you talked about working, you know, talking to Dominic and, course nicholas and reggie and and all the guys out there at cape what was that experience like because uh i will tell you that i've been around a lot of racers and i feel like cape i i just i love their spirit and what was that experience like for you you know i love their passion yeah. i mean if those guys could they would stay in usf 2000 grooming talent for the rest of their life right because they love the raw the intensity and I've never seen guys so committed to racing. I mean, those guys are in the shop Monday through Saturday. And I'm sure if their wives let them, they'd be in there on Sunday too. Right. right. <laughs> and, and there's no other commitment like that. They drive, they both drive the trucks. I mean, I can't remember the last time I saw a team owner, especially at this level, driving the, the diesel to the track. Right. So, so just that raw passion uh, that runs through all of them, um, no, you can't replace. And they're some of the most honest, good yep. people I've, I've worked with, right? They are who they are. They like what they like. And 
and you have to respect that. And they, and they, they're just, you know, Dominic is very tough and very, like very focused, but you know, inside he's one of the sweetest people there are. Nicholas, Reggie, they're all, they all have tons of love for not only racing, but the people they work with. Um, so, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, and if you don't want the truth, don't ask them. No, exactly. Because they're going to give you the truth whether you want to hear it or not. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I think they're going to be very successful in Indy Lights. Um, and it'll be interesting to see see how it all plays out in the crap in five months when we're in St. Pete. Yeah, it's coming up. You got to – so you like you said, you're, so that's really kind of your goal then is try to do an Indy Lights deal? Yeah, yeah. I was talking with – I don't know if it'll – which team it'll be with at the moment. Um working on a few different things, but yeah, have some, some support and continuing to, to grow that. It's all about fundraising at the end of the day. So just seeing, seeing how much money we can get together and uh, yeah, get through a testing program in January, February, get to St. Petersburg and just, just keep on going race by race. So now have you, have you run an Indy pro car or whatever the name, the name of those series have changed to Indy pro 2000. Yeah. Or USF pro 2000 is what they call it now. Now, I never I ran one of those. It's supposedly very similar to the to the USF 2000. Yeah, I always when I look at it, it feels like almost a redundant step in, in the in the ladder. I feel like there needs to be some sort of uh, space in there. Like there needs to be a bigger jump. I feel. Yeah, you know, unfortunate. I could see them maybe just making the USF 2000 faster. Right, maybe adding a limited slip diff, a little bit more arrow, especially now that they have the junior championship. Right. Um, and the the thing is, a full season in Pro 2000, you're not that far away from an Indy Lights budget at the end of the right. day. Right? Right. And, right. And so you have to look at okay, remove yourself from being the kid with dad's money to spend for ten years in a row. You have to look at on the commercial side: is there that? Is it 75% of the value of Indy Lights? And you have to do that calculation for yourself. And, uh, you know, you need to you put yourself on the best stage where if you show up and you show well, you're going to actually get somewhere with it. So, yeah, it's it's a shame because it's a great opportunity. I mean, running on IndyCar weekends is the whole value of the championship. But yep. at the end of the day, we're always going to have something to say about these championships. They're not perfect. They're all right. too much money, right? We're always going to say they're too much money. Um, and you just kind of have to navigate through it all. So, yeah, I, I, I think you're absolutely right on that. <laughs> Racers are never happy with anything. Yeah. If you, if you find a racer who says everything's perfect, look out. Cause some bad's getting really exactly. getting ready to happy because that is not how that works. Exactly. Um, if it's a good price, we're going to complain that the cars are too cheap. If it's right. too expensive, we're going <laughs> to complain that we're using too many tires. So we're always going to have something to say. <laughs> so you just have to, to weed through it all and, it kind of is what it is. It's what we love. So, no, you're absolutely right, um, man. I, I just want to say thanks for coming on. Uh, I feel like I have like a ton more questions, but I I don't I don't kind of know how to formulate them with you right now. Okay. Um, and uh, like, do you have any merch sales or anything you want to plug or any charity? Um, you work with? No, I mean just. Yeah, no, no merch. So, I mean, obviously I wear this, but I guess I haven't decided to sell them yet. Um, but I guess part of maybe moving up into Indie Lights, I need to have merch. So that's something I'll, I'll consider doing this off season. Um, but I do work with a charity called Gamers Outreach. Um, yeah, they, they provide, you know, video games for, for kids in extended stay hospitals. And, and oh, okay. uh, you know, the owner over there is, uh, you know, he's a huge IndyCar fan and huge motorsport fanatic. So um, yeah, they have these things called go-karts and, and they really, they really, really help a lot of kids in need. So, um, yeah, if you guys want to go check out what they do, yeah, it's just gamers outreach. And, uh, yeah, other than that, it's just, you know, all my own personal sponsors, touchstone helicopters, Sparko USA, um, molecule sports, global racing group, so many great people, um, behind the scenes who, who come together to, to make this all happen. And, and that list is just ever growing as we go into next year. So. Well, well, Nikki, thank- it's been an absolute pleasure. Like I said, I, I've always wanted to say, oh, there was one other thing. Now, I'm very sorry. I, I saw you talking to the, obviously, uh, at Indy, you were talking to the guys that run the Kenyon card deal. This was mm-hmm. one question I wanted to ask you. Had you looked at, uh, I mean, it's not like a series that you're going to 
obviously graduate too, but have you looked in or maybe running something like that as well? Yeah. So Brad Hayes actually in 2018, he put me in his F1600 cars, Formula Ford equivalent at the time. So I met him just walking around the track. He used to live out here in California. So he was out at Auto Club Speedway. And it was just like your old fashioned story of me and my dad were walking around the track at a SUCA race, kept in contact. And that was my first ever opportunity to jump into an open wheel car. So every, every time I see him, I say, this is all his fault. <laughs> you know, me going <laughs> to the open wheel. Uh, and, you know, he moved back to Indy um, a few years ago and he started running the, the, he took over the series, him and his wife. Uh, so it was, they're just longtime friends of mine. Um, and I think next year I'm going to try and do some races because I, I, I'm seriously intrigued by, by all the oval racing that goes on in the Midwest that doesn't really exist too much out here in California. So maybe you'll see me pop into one of those next year. I will tell you that a Kenyan car is not as fast, obviously, as a full midget or something like that. But you go run somewhere like Anderson, you know you've been to a racetrack. I mean, yeah. Ed Anderson is as tough as it gets. Yeah. Yeah, I look forward because I know, like, obviously open wheel, like that's kind of my bread and butter, but those guys with oval racing who race all the time there, it would be an eye opener. And there's going to be something you take away from that, that you can take over to the big cars, you know, with the open wheel stuff on the, at the fast oh, ovals we do. So we'll see. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you once again, Nikki, for coming on and definitely look forward to seeing you Indy lights and hopefully one day IndyCar. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you, Nikki. Awesome. Thanks. Talk to you soon.